thank you very much. Um, is, is the sound level okay? Is, is it okay everywhere? Yeah? Fine, good, good. Um, fine. Um, let's start there. Well, I should begin by stressing that I'm not an expert on Japan, but what I should be doing is looking at Japan through the eyes of Van Gogh, who saw um, Japanese art through its prints. And the prints must have seemed incredibly bright and exotic to Van Gogh in his time. I mean, they do to us now. And um, the Japanese printmakers tackled uh, motifs in such a different way from European artists. And we're now so used to being bombarded with colour images on screens and in print. But in the 19th century, colour printing was expensive and fairly crude. So the Japanese prints had an enormous impact on the Impressionists and the post-Impressionists. What I can promise you this evening are some wonderful images of Van Gogh's paintings and Japanese prints. My focus will be on Provence, where Van Gogh spent more than two years and where he produced his finest art in 1888 to 1890. He stayed in two places. Um, first of all, in the town of Arles, where um, he lived in the famous Yellow House, or now famous Yellow House, and then secondly, in the asylum just outside the nearby town of saint rémy de provence um, I've recently written three books on this period. The most recent one was his time at the asylum, Starry Night. Um, and before that, I did one on his period in Al Studio of the South. And the third book is, um, and I've just got a copy here, um, The Sunflowers Are Mine, which is being published in paperback next week. Um, now, before we start on Provence, um, I just want to go back slightly earlier um, to explain how Van Gogh discovered Japanese art. It was in Antwerp, where he stayed for a few months in the winter of 1885 to 6. And this was a time when he really began to develop as a modern painter. And in Antwerp, there is the first reference in Van Gogh's letters to Japanese prints. And he wrote to his brother, Theo, my studio is quite tolerable, mainly because I've pinned a set of Japanese prints on the walls that I find very diverting. You know, those little female figures in gardens or on the shore, horsemen, flowers, gnarled thorn branches. And it was in the spring of 1886 that Vincent moved to Paris, where he stayed with his brother Theo, and it was there that he really and collected Japanese prints, and he assembled an astonishing number of them, over 600, as far as we know, and possibly considerably more. And by good fortune, most of them were saved, and there are now 500 at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. I, I say collected, but that may not be the best word. Um, new research for a book on the museum's Japanese prints by a Dutch specialist, Chris Uhlenbeck, suggests that Vincent acquired many of the prints as a single lot from the noted Paris dealer Siegfried Bing. Van Gogh apparently, ori apparently originally intended to make some money by selling them on at a profit to his artist friends, but he failed to do so and ended up keeping them himself. And once he set off to become an artist, Van Gogh was never any good at making money. Um, one of the best evidence, one of the best pieces of evidence about Van Gogh's interest in Japanese prints is a portrait that he made of Per Tongi, um, who we have here. Um, Tongi was a seller of paints to Parisian avant-garde artists, and he was deeply committed uh, to progressive art. And Van Gogh has pr provided a lovely, colourful background of Japanese prints. They were probably not pinned to Tongi's wall like this, but Van Gogh has made an assemblage. He's created it from his own um, prints, own copies of prints. And um, in the upper right-hand corner, uh, just up there, uh, you can clearly see a Hiroshigi print of a cherry tree. In Paris, Japanese prints had a direct influence on several of Van Gogh's paintings, and I'd like to show you three of the clearest examples. <coughs> 
Um, sorry, this was a Hiroshigi painting. Um, I'll go back to that, which is in the corner. Um, and this is a squared up print, a uh, squared up uh, um, uh, uh, tracing of a print that Van Gogh used um, in a painting. This is by Eisen of a courtesan. And um, it's squared up so he could use it for the painting. And then this is the painting. And uh, he's used the Japanese print in the middle. And then he sort of invented a rather wonderful border with different motifs of, of, of Japanese-influenced motifs. That's his own invention. And uh, now I'll show you two other examples of paintings inspired by Hiroshige. Uh, this is the Hiroshige print of an evening shower. Um, and the rain is depicted with sort of angled continuous lines, which is quite an unusual feature in European art. Um, and it's clear that Van Gogh used that print because we can see his painting uh, where he's reproduced it in the middle. And again, he's added a decorative border, this time with rather inventive uh, Japanese characters. Um, the, those are people who can read Japanese in the audience will um, be able to uh, confirm that, I'm hoping. <laughs> um, then uh, this is another very famous um, Hiroshigi print of a flowering plum tree. And um, again, Van Gogh copied it and added um, his own border on the left and the right side. So after this rather brief stop in Paris, let's move on to Provence, which is what I'm really talking about. Um, and first of all, to Van Gogh's period of 15 months in Arles. Um, he went on the overnight train in February 1886, and when he arrived, the countryside was blanketed with snow, which is quite unusual there because it's more like a, it's sort of a bit of a Mediterranean climate there. And Vincent wrote to Theo in great anticipation about what he could see from the window of the train on the, early in the morning when he was arriving. And Vincent wrote to his brother, the landscape under the snow with the white peaks against the sky as bright as the snow was just like the winter landscapes the Japanese did. And this is one of Vincent's um, landscapes. This is a court old picture. Um, and uh, it shows the hills of Les Alpes in the background. Um, Vincent tended to paint his hills blue. Uh, and we certainly have it there. And when he came in by train, he would have seen this line of hills from the end. So it would have been much more like a, a pyramid and sort of pointy. And I think it may well have reminded him of images of Mount Fuji, which are so prevalent in Japanese art. Now, Vincent initially lodged at a hotel, and then after three months, he rented his own house, uh, the Yellow House. And here we have it there. And this uh, will give you an idea of Vincent's world. Um, the yellow house which he had was, oh, sorry. Um, um, uh, was, was, this was the yellow house. He had this half. This half was actually a grocery shop. Um, that was his front door. And um, that's his bedroom where the shutters are closed. And the guest room where Gauguin stayed has the shutters open. And the front room would have been the sitting room or the lounge uh, for most people, but uh, Vincent was not most people, and he turned it into his studio um, and left mess all over the place. But the back room was the kitchen, um, uh, but again, his studio sort of spread into the kitchen. And um, if you want to know where the loo was, um, he used the loo for the cafe, which is just at the back. <laughs> Um, and then uh, that was the train which would have um, uh, brought him um, from Par uh, to and from Paris. And the way to the countryside uh, was up that little road. And the restaurant where he used to have his supper is just behind the tree there. So it was quite a nice sort of cosy world he had there when things were working well. Um, but the painting gives a very vivid idea of his uh, marvellous colours. Um, um, the yellows contrasting dramatically with the very deep blue sky. 
Um, and um, it doesn't come over all that well on this image, but the, the yellow of his house really sort of shines when you see the original painting in Amsterdam. And his use of strong colors was partly inspired by Japanese prints. I mean, he was very interested in colors anyway, but I think he, Japanese prints encouraged him. And Van Gogh immediately dreamed of sharing his new home with a fellow artist from Paris. Um, not only would it be cheaper for two sharing together, but it would be stimulating to live and work with a companion. And he called his building the Studio of the South, and Gauguin would come and join him for two months in the autumn. And he saw the arrangement as a sort of cooperative um, a for artists, and it was partly inspired by his view of how Japanese artists operated. I'm not sure they did operate like that, but he thought they did, um, and it helped to justify in his own mind what he was doing. And for Van Gogh, the countryside around Arles was really an extension of his studio in the south, and he relished working outdoors in front of the motifs in the landscapes that had enticed him away from the city, from Paris. Um, so here we have one of his orchard scenes. Um, when Van Gogh arrived in Arles, the first signs of blossom were just beginning to emerge from the snowy landscape. And he was so enthralled by the fruit trees that he painted 15 pictures from late March to late April. He worked very intensively whilst the, the flowers were out. Um, th this particular, this is actually two trees. It's a bit difficult to see, but there's a second tree hiding behind the first one. And Van Gogh described it, and his words are, two peach trees in full bloom, pink against the sparkling blue sky with white clouds and in sunshine. And he finished this picture on the 30th of March, 1888, which was his 35th birthday. I mean, of course, he painted orchards because he found them beautiful, as we all would. But he also knew that they were one of the favorite motifs of Japanese artists. All Japanese love the spring with the beautiful blossoms that are such a transitory um, feature of the landscape and our existence. And I think in Europe, we're sorry to see the blossoms fall after their brief life. But in Japan, uh, people are more philosophical, and there's a, a, a realization that the falling blossoms will be followed a year later with a fresh growth. And in painting a series of 15 quite different um, blossom and orchard scenes, it was a series, and um, this was similar in some ways to the practice of Japanese artists such as Hokusai, who did his famous 36 views of Mount Fiji. Now, another important aspect of Van Gogh's painting, which he took from the Japanese, was the abrupt cropping of images, particularly of trees. And this was not all that usual in earlier European art. Um, this is one of the examples. Um, this is an orchard scene done from just outside Arles, and you can see the, uh, uh, the, uh, largest, the largest building there is the ch important church in Arles. This was actually painted a year after he'd arrived, shortly before he left. Um, but it's still very typical of his work there. Um, and I think it's rather lovely the way that the red roofs um, contrast and are complementary to the, the, the wonderful green foreground. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> and uh, the orchard tree at the back is fairly similar to his other orchard trees. The, the one on the right-hand side nearest us um, is rather sort of Japanese in the concept. It's sort of, uh, it's rather stark, abrupt, the way the branches go out and the way it's cropped. So there's definitely a Japanese influence there. And similarly, um, in fact, this is possibly an even better example um, of a cropped tree and the, the very old trunk and uh, the, the, the sort of the, the partly the dead stems and the little fresh growth which is coming, and the marvelous um, sun at the back, uh, which is obviously very exaggerated and turns out to be a bit of a halo um, over the sower. Um, so this is a very strongly influenced Japanese picture. Uh, now let's move on to Van Gogh's most famous image. <clears throat> 
Um, Van Gogh painted three versions of the yellow sunflowers against the yellow background. And um, one of them is not very far away at the National Gallery. Um, this is actually the version which was sold in 1987 for the record price of 25 million pounds, which was a huge sum then for artworks. And it was bought by what was then the Yasuda Insurance Company, which is now part of Ins Sompo Insurance. And this painting is displayed in a slightly surrealist setting, if you like. It's on the 42nd floor of the company's head office in Tokyo, where there's uh, a museum which is open uh, to the public. Um, so it's not what you might expect at the top of a skyscraper in Tokyo. But I think Van Gogh actually would be thrilled if he'd known that his picture had ended up in Japan. I mean, he could never sell his own work, um, and Japan had so inspired him. Um, so um, it is marvellous to think that it did end up there. But there's another much less well-known sunflower, which has an even more important Japanese angle. Uh, the painting, the first Van Gogh to come to Japan in 1920, belonged to a collector in Oshia, but it was tragically destroyed in 1945 um, by Allied bombing, and the painting was simply burnt. It was in a very heavy frame, and it couldn't be moved. And this actually happened on the very day of the Hiroshima um, bombing. It was not destroyed by the nuclear, by the atomic bomb, but by a conventional bomb which the Allies dropped. Now, I found an early colour image of the painting um, in a portfolio of four prints, uh, which was published in Japan in 1921. Uh, this portfolio was not known about. And it may come as a surprise, but there, were, um, there was actually more interest in, among the Japanese avant-garde circles in the 1920s in Van Gogh than there was in most European countries. And what may come as more of a surprise is that there were more images of Van Gogh paintings published in colour by the early 1930s in Japan than in Europe and North America altogether. I mean, that is astonishing. And um, this image of the sunflowers from this 1922 portfolio provides us with the best colour reproduction of the picture. And we can see uh, the, the intense royal blue uh, which Van Gogh used. Uh, and he juxtaposed it um, with the sort of orange and yellow flowers, creating such a vibrant effect. And that's the painting close up. Um, but with this print, um, I made an, uh, a more important discovery, and that is that the print um, has, what, has around it this orange border. Now, I had assumed that initially that it was something the publishers had added in, in order to make um, the print more uh, attractive, and it wasn't part of the original. But I then looked back at Van Gogh's letters, and he wrote from Arles that um, the, the sunflowers was, quote, framed with thin laths painted in orange. So this was actually the frame that Van Gogh made for this specific painting, and it survived until 1945, although the owner in Japan would not have recognized that it was the original frame. Uh, and it's one of the, f it's, it's probably the last Van Gogh original frame which survived. Um, so that makes the lost ruin in the war um, even more sad. And this sunflowers is actually the most Japanese of all of the artist paintings of these blooms. First of all, it's the most stylized. Um, and Japanese artists uh, worked in a very stylized way when they were painting flowers or whatever. And Van Gogh has not stylized them in the same way, but he has stylized them in his own personal way. And to me, there's another aspect of the painting which is reminiscent of a Japanese approach, because the flowers are at different stages of their life. Um, down here, there's a little bud that's just beginning to come into flower, uh, uh, that bud has come out a bit further. Then we have these flowers, which these three flowers, which um, are sort of in full bloom. This flower is older and it's turning to seed, so it will be dying quite soon. Um, um, and that brings us back again to the the Japanese um, idea about the transience of life and um, the fact that 
um, dead life, like the, uh, the seeds in the sunflower, um, it, the, will uh, ultimately be used to create more sunflowers. Um, my only concern about the bud is that I'm not sure this bud here is going to live much longer unless the artist puts it back in the pot. <laughs> Uh, now, um, uh, in September 1889, before Gauguin arrived in Arles, the two artists exchanged self-portraits, and this is Van Gogh's self-portrait, uh, with his hair nearly shaved off and with a rather gaunt expression. But Van Gogh actually wanted to portray himself as a Japanese monk, which may seem a slightly curious idea. He said, and I quote from his letter, he said, he was trying to show in my portrait not only myself, but an impressionist in general. And by impressionist, he meant modern artist. And he said, I conceived this portrait as being that of a bonze, that is, a, a Buddhist teacher, a simple worshipper of the eternal Buddha. So it's, sort of, it's his homage to Japan. And he obviously realized that Gauguin shared the same views of the importance of Japanese art. So uh, he wanted to make that point to his companion Gauguin. And Gauguin arrived at the end of October 1888 to stay with Van Gogh in the Yellow House. And although the two artists had very different personalities and temperaments, um, initially they got on well, and they were excited, they set up their easels side by side and painted the same motifs. And they had endless discussions about art long into the night um, over a glass or a bottle of wine or absinthe. Now, you're probably waiting for me to deal with the ear incident because um, the question I'm asked most often uh, by the public is why did Van Gogh cut off his ear and then present it to a prostitute? Um, um, I mean, beside, behind this sensationalist query lies a more serious conundrum. Uh, what made someone who is so creative become so destructive? And Claude Monet once put it so beautifully when he wrote about Van Gogh. He said... How could a man who has loved flowers and light so much and has rendered them so well, how could he have managed to be so unhappy? I'll just say a few words because I'm supposed to be talking about Japan. But I believe that the trigger uh, for the incident was a fear of abandonment. Um, two months after his arrival, relations with Gauguin deteriorated. And despite their differences, Van Gogh was terrified that Gauguin would leave and return to Paris. Uh, and Gauguin was threatening to do so. And secondly, and more seriously, just a few hours before Van Gogh mutilated his ear, he received a letter from his brother Theo. And when he opened the envelope, the news was that Theo had just become engaged. Uh, he'd only met the woman ten days before. It was extremely quick. Um, and Theo provided Vincent with a financial allowance and the support which enabled him to work as an artist. And Theo was his closest friend and confidant. And I think Vincent therefore feared that a wife and probably children would mean that it would, he would lose his support. But although the trigger for the self-mutilation may have been a fear of abandonment, um, the deeper medical cause still remains a mystery. At the time, Van Gogh's doctors diagnosed epilepsy, but this is unlikely. Hundreds of medical specialists have written papers on the artist's condition, but there is no consensus. However, bipolar disorder is regarded as the most likely diagnosis. But let's move on to another self-portrait. Um, this is, again, is a court old picture. Um, Van Gogh is in his studio in the Yellow House, um, and you can see the door there that leads, uh, that's the front door that leads into the, um, the square in front. Um, so that was the door that you saw in his painting. Um, and it's late January, so not surprisingly, um, Vincent is wearing his winter gear. Um, but of course, what stands out um, is the bandage around the place where he'd lost his ear. And he'd obviously um, made no effort uh, to disguise um, what had happened. I mean, he could have shown his other ear. He deliberately uh, faced that way. So it was either a way of coming or trying to come to terms with what had happened, or he was saying, giving some message to his brother, I've had this 
incident, but I'm still working in painting. Um, and it's fascinating to think what lies behind uh, this important picture. And behind him is his easel, again, uh, to symbolize the fact that he's back at work. Um, it's not very easy to read uh, what this sort of lightly sketched in um, object is, but I think it's probably the beginnings of a flower still life. I mean, it looks like sort of stems uh, and, and uh, leaves or flowers. Um, but for tonight, the most important point, obviously, for us is this print at the back. At the back, um, pinning up prints is a habit he'd had since Antwerp, which has annoyed countless landlords who didn't appreciate all little holes in the wall. Um, um, so we're coming back to Antwerp, where the story began, in a sense. Now, the print itself is. Um, oh, sorry. Um, here we are. This version has got a decorative border, which Van Gogh's copy didn't have. Um, and I really find the border rather distracting, but you can see the image um, in the middle. Van Gogh's own copy was saved, and it was later donated to the Courtauld Gallery, uh, which ends the painting. Um, but sadly, the print was stolen in 1981. Um, so please all keep your eyes open if you ever see this print on any market stall. Um, I'll just go back uh, so you can see the painting, the, uh, sorry, the painting again and the print, and now we'll move on to the print. So it's the woman in the middle that's sort of the dominant feature. Uh, now Van Gogh had mutilated his ear just before Christmas 1888, and although the physical wound held healed remarkably quickly, he went on to suffer a series of further mental attacks. And in May 1889, he agreed to go to the mental asylum at saint paul de Mosol in a former monastery just outside the town of saint rémy de provence which is 20 kilometers from Arles. Now, I won't go into the story of the asylum since I deal with it in my latest book, Starry Night, but I will just mention that I discovered an unknown register for the asylum patients, which has not been known to Van Gogh specialists, and it's very unusual for new documentary material to turn up. And it made it, named, it made it possible to identify the other 18 patients. It was a very small place um, that were at the asylum, and one could see what sort of conditions they suffered from and where they came from, so that's very interesting. Um, the artist, Vincent, described the other patients as my companions in misfortune. <clears throat> now, on his very first day at the asylum, in, this was in May, Van Gogh went outside into the walled garden, which he, which he came to love, and he painted a row of irises. And one could hardly imagine a more optimistic image, and particularly considering that it was painted on the first day of someone's arrival in an insane asylum. And uh, they were not like mental hospitals today. Um, uh, conditions uh, were very difficult, and uh, there was very little understood about causes of mental illness and uh, what could be done to alleviate or cure them. And, of course, Van Gogh was obviously enthralled at seeing the flowers, the fresh flowers blooming in the spring, um, in this rather overgrown um, garden. But he was also aware that irises are a very popular motif in Japanese art. And I can just imagine how astonished the other patients in the mental asylum must have been by Van Gogh's arrival. First of all, he only had one ear. Um, but secondly, he was an artist, and um, uh, probably no one at the asylum, not even the staff, had ever met an artist. And then he set up his easel in the garden, and then by lunchtime, he'd done this painting. Um, you can, um, uh, at great speed, um, I mean, it is amazing. Um, to begin with, he said that the other patients didn't actually rudely look to see what he was doing. By the end of this day, um, he complained that they did, and I suspect they were very curious, even if they weren't looking too closely on when he arrived. And d during his year-long stay at Van Gogh, of the asylum, Van Gogh suffered a series of further mental attacks, but he was, and during those periods, he was no longer able to paint. Um, 
But astonishingly, he complete, completed 150 pictures during that year, which is one every two days. And I want to focus um, on two that he completed towards the end of his stay. Um, we'll go on to this one. Um, this is Iris's in a vase. This was done a year later um, after his arrival when the um, irises came out again. And instead of doing them in the garden, this time he's doing them in a pot, which is remarkably similar to the pot he used for the, same, for the sunflowers, as you will notice. And um, it's a very exuberant picture. Um, with the sort of rather dagger-like um, um, leaves and the wonderful blue flowers set against a complementary yellow background. And one step stem has just broken and fallen and lying at the side. And I think he did it for two reasons, really. It, it may appear a rather curious thing to do, but it breaks the symmetry of the picture and makes the composition more interesting but it also reminds us again about the transience of life and the fact that these flowers will only last two or three days um, in this pot. Now he's cut them from the garden. Um, so again, in a subtle way, I think Van Gogh was thinking of the motif and the ideas um, in relation to Japanese art. Uh, now this picture, um, which I'm sure you will recognize, um, this is Armand. Uh, almond, almond uh, Blossom. It's a painting at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. And in Provence, it's the almond trees which herald the arrival of spring. They're the first trees that blossom. <coughs> um, and again, I think the composition was partly inspired by Japanese prints um, because of the way the trees have been cropped and, of course, the motif of blossom. And at first glance, the composition appears quite natural. I mean, as if the artist had almost been lying on the grass, looking up uh, through the tree at um, uh, the blue sky. Uh, but if you look more carefully, it's an artfully created complex arrangement. And the branches in the upper right, that's up there, are not quite connected. And there the are two sort of crossing branches here, which I suspect are separate. So I think what Vincent has done is to actually cut some branches down and take them to his studio um, in, in the asylum and work on them there. <coughs> and although it's nothing to do with Japan, I can't resist telling you another story about this painting. Uh, I managed to track down what may well have been the actual almond tree. And this is it. And uh, there were two long-term residents of saint Remy who took me to this venerable tree. And they can sometimes last to 150 years, so it is possible. And the evidence they gave me, which I can't share with you, I'm afraid, because we want to keep the uh, location of the tree a secret to protect it. Um, uh, it may not last another 150 years, but I'd like it to last um, uh, my lifetime, uh, maybe 50 years more. Um, I thought the evidence was fairly convincing, but not conclusive. But it's lovely to think of this tree as representing possibly a living link between Van Gogh's time and our own time. So we have now reached um, the uh, finale, at least in artistic terms. This, of course, is the most famous painting from that Van Gogh did at the asylum. And the dark landscape at the bottom, it's very loosely based on the area around the asylum. And you can see the mountains there uh, on the horizon, or hills, I should say, large hills, uh, which Van Gogh was sort of thinking in terms of Mount Fuji when he arrived in the snow. Um, uh, this chain of mountains goes from saint Remy towards Arles, which is why he would have seen it in both places. But of course, the dominant feature is, is the, the, the night sky. And the crescent moon sort of almost vibrates within its uh, circle, circular yellowish halo. And I think maybe the whitish band above the hills 
might be the Milky Way. I mean, that's just a, a possible thought. Um, but the Milky Way would have been so strong in this area, there would have been very little artificial light at night, and uh, one would have seen it as a white band in a way that us Londoners, unfortunately, never do. But tumbling across um, the centre of the sky is, is the, the most extraordinary feature, which is this whirl of flickering brush strokes, uh, which really impart a strong sense of movement to the scene. And Van Gogh was a keen observer of the night sky. Um, his bedroom window, it had bars in it, on it, uh, but he could look through the bars and enjoy the sky at night and the view of the mountains at the back. And he once wrote about the stars. He said, the sight of the stars always makes me dream in as simple a way as the black spots on the map representing towns and villages make me dream. And I can imagine that it was a blissful moment of escape when he looked up at the night sky before he uh, um, turned, uh, turned into bed. Now, I want to make a slightly daring suggestion. Um, was Van Gogh inspired by Hokusai's great wave when he painted Starry Night? And the link between these two masterpieces of 19th century art done on different sides of the ends of the globe um, doesn't seem to have been made before. But Vincent was a great admirer of this Japanese print, and he wrote very vividly to his brother Teo. He said, Hokusai's waves are claws. The boat is caught in them. You can feel it. And Van Gogh's interest in the great wave is well known to specialists on the artist, but not so widely by experts on Japan. And when Tim Clark was curating his magnificent exhibition at the British Museum in 2017 on Hokusai, um, on the Great Wave. I mentioned Van Gogh's uh, letter, and as a result, Clark emblazoned the quote about the claws on the wall above the print, which was lovely. So, um, here we have the Great Wave, and um, it towers above the volcanic peak of Mount Fuji, uh, whereas in, in Van Gogh's painting, uh, the swirling mass of the sky hurtles towards the more gentle slopes of Les Alpes. And it's also interesting the two works share a similar colouring of rich um, blues. Now, uh, there we see the two works together. And I don't know what you think, but um, there are some similarities about uh, uh, the, the two works. Um, I don't want to suggest that, I don't want my suggestion to go too far. I'm only suggesting it was loosely inspired by the Great Wave. And of course, Starry Night is a product of Van Gogh's. Uh, unbridled imagination, and it was sparked off by all sorts of things. The Provencal landscape, which he loved, uh, looking up at the sky at night and everything. But I think the influences do include the Great Wave, which in his time had only been created 50 years earlier. Uh, we now think of it as very old, but in Van Gogh's time, it was middle-aged. So, um, to conclude um, the story, um, Van Gogh became increasingly fed up with life at the asylum, and he left in May 1890, a year and a week after his arrival. And he then returned to Paris, where he stayed with Theo and Theo's new wife, Yo Bonga, and their baby Vincent for four days. And among the art he saw in Paris, or almost certainly saw, was a very important exhibition of Japanese prints organized by the dealer Bing and others at the École des Beaux-Arts. And then after his very short visit to Paris, he went on to Auvers-sur-Oise, which would be the last step in his journey through life. It all seemed to be going well, but then just over two months later, on the 27th of July, 1890, he shot himself in the wheat fields. This didn't kill him, uh, and he staggered back to his inn and died two, year, two days later with Theo by his side. And um, for me, Starry Night is the painting is emblematic of Van Gogh's last year and a half. And although he worked much of the time uh, when he was mentally alert, he worked prodigiously, but he also suffered a series of crises which thrust him into darkness that made it impossible to paint. Yet, I mean, each time he recovered and re-emerged from the despair he was suffering, and he would return into the light and take up his brush again. 
So Starry Night is a vibrant testimony to his struggle to overcome the challenges that he was facing. And um, to end with, I'd just like to give you a final quote um, from Vincent. I mean, he, 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 he was, this is a continuation of the quote he gave about uh, the sight of the stars always makes me dream um, in a simple way as the black spots on the map. Uh, and he said, um, just as we take the train to go to Tarascon or Rouen, we take death to go to a star. While alive, we cannot go to a star. Any more than once we're dead, we can take the train. And Vincent then went on to describe illnesses such as cholera and cancer as a celestial means of locomotion. And he concluded, to die peacefully of old age would be to go there on foot. Um, so uh, thank you very much. And I will be um, signing copies of uh, the new book, Starry Night. And there are a few copies of Studio of the South uh, which are also on sale. They are, uh, the print run has finished at the publishers, so they're the, the very last copies, but they are available here. Uh, and the paperback of the Sunflower book will be available next week. And I'd be very happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Um, my question is, where did he keep all of his paintings? If he never sold any of them, and he made so many, where, like it's more of a practical question. Where did he put them? Yeah, well, the answer to that is actually quite simple. Um, his brother, Theo, was giving him a financial allowance, and the arrangement was that Theo would send him the money, and all the paintings would belong um, to Theo and would be returned to him. And Theo was supposed to sell them and make some money to recoup them, recoup uh, the allowance. Of course, Theo failed to sell any paintings because they weren't appreciated. So what Vincent would do would be to send consignments of paintings, uh, maybe every three or four months, he would send sort of 20 or 30 pictures, mostly with, without the stretcher frames. He would send them to Theo, and Theo kept them all. Um, a lot of them were kept under the bed, um, and then there were too many under the bed. So some of them were stored with Per Tongi, who was the uh, dealer who, uh, who was, whose portrait I showed you earlier with the prints in the background. Um, so all the paintings belonged to Theo. Theo, unfortunately, died six months after Vincent. He had syphilis. And they were then inherited by Theo's um, widow, Yo Bonga. And she had great faith in, Van, in Vincent and kept the pictures. She sold some of them in order partly to make some money, but also to um, uh, make Vincent's work more well-known. And for example, the sunflowers at the National Gallery that we have here in London. The National Gallery wanted to buy them in, 19, I think it was 1923, and um, she initially didn't want to sell the painting. She said she'd woke up every morning for the last 30 years seeing the sunflower painting. And then the National Gallery um, uh, tried to use the, every, all, the, all the things they could use. They said it would, be, it would make Van Gogh famous to be shown in London. And in the end, she agreed, and she wrote a very moving letter in English, because she, in Eng she, she wrote English well, to say that she was uh, selling the painting for the sake of Vincent's glory. She didn't make much money. She got about £1,000 for the picture. Uh, well, um, I don't know what it's worth now. Uh, that we're talking of um, and hundreds of millions of pounds. Um, sorry, that's rather a long answer, but it's quite interesting to know what happened to the pictures. He gave away a few to friends and sitters, but not very many. So that's why so many paintings survive at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, because they're the ones that she didn't sell. Sorry for the long answer. <laughs> Just gentlemen. <clears throat> Do you think that Van Gogh had an understanding of the sensibility of Japanese paintings? Um, you showed the image of the lost sunflowers with the life cycle, the dying flower, the bud, uh, the flowers in full bloom, or do you think he was just copying um, the motifs and images of Japanese paintings? I, don't, I think at this stage he wasn't copying them. I mean, he was copying them very deliberately and openly when he was in Paris, which was those three ones I showed you that were based on Japanese prints. After that, when he went to Provence, 
Um, he, he became a more imaginative painter. He was working by himself, not in Paris, where he was surrounded by colleagues. So in Provence, I think he allowed himself to bloom, if I can use that expression, because he was doing exactly what he thought was right, and he wasn't worrying what the, the artist standing a few feet away in, in Paris was, was, was saying. Uh, so I think it really was his idea. Um, I've stressed the Japanese angle, because that's what... Uh, I was, that's the point of this evening's presentation, but I don't want to give a misleading impression. He was influenced uh, by English prints when he was working in the Netherlands. He was very influenced by uh, French artists and Dutch artists. Uh, but his talent was to bring all of this together um, in an imaginative way. If you'd asked him whether he was influenced by Japanese prints when he did a particular picture, I'm not sure that he would necessarily consciously have known that he was, but I think there was a, there was a strong um, inspiration there. Um, but um, it came out in a, in a diffuse, um, not a crude way, if I can put it like that. In relation to his landscapes, do you think the fact that uh, there wasn't a need to adhere to perspective and a vanishing point in Japanese prints uh, gave him something of a freedom. I know he had some challenges using the perspective frame. And yes, I, th I think that's certainly true, and that's possibly something I should have said. I think you're quite right. Um, and, for example, if you see the painting of his bedroom, which you, most people can probably imagine, uh, the perspective um, uh, is very curious, and the bed is the, the wrong sort of size and angle. Um, it is partly because the room was not rectangular. Um, uh, where the uh, wall of the yellow house um, faced onto the square, there was a slight angle. But he's exaggerated that, and he's made the bed a most bizarre shape. Um, and again, it's his imagination. And I guess the fact that Japanese weren't worried about um, perspective in the way that European artists were, uh, you know, legitimised that, that technique. So I think you're quite right, and that's an important point. Hi, um, just a quick question. Yeah, yeah. So should, we, should we go to that room first? Sure, yeah. hi. Um, just a quick question about how Van Gogh had access to all of these prints at that time from Japan. Yes, I mean, he, he, acquired, uh, he, he acquired most of them uh, from this Paris dealer Bing, and he appears to have bought a job lot of um, 500 or so prints, which seems bizarre. He bought them, they were very cheap. Um, I'm still not quite sure how he got the money. Teo must have put it up. Um, the prints uh, would have cost... Um, well, I was always rather amused. Um, when, the, when the Japanese are talking about how much a Hokusai print would say, they would say it would, that the Great Wave would have cost the equivalent of a bowl of noodles. Um, in Europe, uh, when the prints arrived here, um, we say they cost the equivalent of a glass of wine. Um, they cost something, but not a great deal. But it is surprising he acquired so many. Um, he also must have acquired some individually, some images that he liked, and um, some that he may have been given. Um, so that's how he acquired them. Sorry, what was the other aspect of your question? I guess it was just understanding um, how they kind of came into circulation in Paris or in, yes, in France I mean, they at that time from yes, Japan. I mean, they, uh, they, they were. Uh, sent in large quantities uh, they were, uh, to, to Europe and then they would have been sold in various ways but this particular dealer Bing um, had a stock of uh, probably ten, tens of thousands if not more of prints so there were a number of dealers in Paris um, who had uh, large holdings that they sold and there was a great interest in Japanese culture in Europe in the second half of the 19th century. So prints were only part of um, the public's interest in Japan. So I imagine these would have also been sold widely in shops that sold uh, Japanese lacquer uh, and other such similar objects. Yeah, because that was the second part of my question is, so Japanese art was quite trendy and fashionable at large at that time? It, it was, and, it, and um, modern artists were becoming interested in Van Gogh, sorry, interested in Japanese art. I mean, Van Gogh was one of the first, but not the first, 
and there were other artists. Whistler, for example, was very interested in Japanese um, prints and quite a lot of the Impressionists. Monet had a fantastic collection of Japanese prints uh, which still survive and uh, they were displayed at Givigny in, uh, in his house. I mean, they're now being replaced by replicas for conservation reasons. So Japanese prints were coming in at that time, you're quite right. And sorry, there's a question here. I think you probably touched on the question that I was going to ask. You, see, you mentioned about Van Gogh, but uh, what about other European artists, especially Impressionists? And even now, is there much influence of Japan on European art? Um, I mean, certainly, as I said, a number of the other Impressionists and post-Impressionists and artists were very interested in Japanese art. Uh, and one does see the influence to some extent. It, it tends, uh, with many artists, uh, to be more featuring Japanese objects in their paintings. Um, for example, um, fans or uh, women wearing kimonos or uh, Japanese uh, or indeed Chinese lanterns. So it's more sort of decorative art uh, that features in the paintings. Um, so Van Gogh is more influenced by the, in sort of terms of style and motif. I should also mention that Gauguin was um, interested in Japanese art and one could see also the way he absorbs various Japanese influences in his art, uh, particularly the works that he did uh, around this time, around 1890, less so in the works that he did when he went to Tahiti. Um, are there any more questions? Or um, or is that the lot? There's one, one over there. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to know if you'd done any research on maybe parallels between other Van uh, Hoff paintings that had prints, Japanese prints in them. And you've been able to identify the prints, but what about the titles of the prints? Um, could there have been, you know, some parallel there between Van Gogh's painting and the print he chose to replicate in his painting, for example? Yes, I mean, he, I don't think he would have known what the titles were because they would have been written in Japanese. Um, I mean, it's possible that they might have been translated if he was buying one individual print, not if he was buying 600. Um, um, so uh, I, he wouldn't have known what the titles were. It's not easy to say why he chose the three particular prints that he did. I mean, it's a good question, but I'm not sure why he, 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 he chose them. I mean, they were obviously common subjects, uh, uh, geisha girl, um, blossoms. Um, uh, uh, he was interested in blossoms. Um, uh, he was interested in women. Um, I'm not quite sure where that uh, fits in with geisha girl. <laughs> um, so I think I think it. I don't. I don't know why. I'd love to be able to ask him why he chose those three particular prints. Um, are we winding up, or or, or, or We're winding up yeah. very shortly? No, yes. that's fine. Is there any last question, or should we finish? Um, um, well, should we finish? We, we can finish the conversation yeah. in the other room. With plenty of time, if you don't mind. Yeah. It would be wonderful. But um, I also just wanted to think for the moment about Akira Kurosawa uh, dreams um, because of his um, short story on Van Gogh yeah. in the wheat field. At that moment when the crows fly and the image and the live cinematic response was just so fantastic. And that's what I feel, you brought it alive for us tonight. And oh. thank you so much. Thank you. So um, may I just say to everyone, thank you all very much for coming. And if you won't mind for two minutes, we're going to move all the chairs in the other room to make way for the reception, and then we'll go through. So please, in the moment, give me a very warm welcome to Martin Bailey. Thank, thank you. you. So much.